This episode of Goosebumps Crew is sponsored by Trophy Smack. Celebrate your wins and losses in style with your own customizable trophies, belts, and rings. Link in the description, but more on that later. The most thrilling, spy tingling series ever. From the pages of R.L. Stein's best selling books, and the screens go on forever and ever. We now return to Goosebumps. <laughs> Goosebumps fans, young and old, big and small, welcome back to the Goosebumps Crew podcast. As always, I'm your host, Isaiah Vargas, also known as the Goosebumps Channel on YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram. And as always, I am joined by the rest of my Goosebumps crew, Goosebumps Aussie fan Bjorn Panwick, Shawin Nick Shaw, and the ultimate Goosebumps man, Michael Lilliquist. And we're back to talk some more Goosebumps. Of course, we're back to talk some more Goosebumps. And uh, we have a very special episode for you guys today. We're doing another episode retrospective on The Girl Who Cried Monster, the fourth episode of season one, and uh, definitely one of the most iconic episodes. And of course, as always, when we do an episode discussion, we got to talk with someone who knows about the episode. And that's why we have Eugene Lipinski here today, Mr. Mortman himself, to talk with us about this episode. Eugene, welcome to the Goosebumps crew, and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. <laughs> Absolutely. We're very excited to talk with you. And we're going to talk, of course, The Girl Cried Monster and the other episode that Eugene was a part of, Night of the Living Dummy 3, where he voiced Rocky the Dummy. And uh, we're going to get into those episodes. But first, before we begin, as always, if you guys are not following the Goosebumps Crew podcast on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts, then what in the heck are you doing? Because if you are a Goosebumps fan, then you guys are certainly going to want to tune in to the podcast. This is episode 18. That means there's 17 other episodes that you guys could watch right after this one. And we've had some incredible guests on the podcast. So if you love Goosebumps, please make sure that you tune in to the Goosebumps Crew podcast. Um, and uh, in terms of news from the Goosebumps world, uh, we do have a new line of Goosebumps products coming from Cavity Colors later this year. More info will be coming about that, but at the time of this recording, uh, it actually was just revealed one of the uh, teases for one of the designs of the Haunted Mask, and it looks really cool. So uh, we'll be giving you guys more info on that as it comes out. All right, time to get down to the nitty gritty. We are going to talk The Girl Who Cried Monster. Like we said, this is episode four of season one, one of the first episodes of the show. And uh, of course, we have Eugene here, Mr. Mortman himself, uh, to tell us a little bit about his experience on that episode. Uh, but before we talk about that episode, why don't you tell us a little about about uh, yourself, Eugene? Um, all right, well, I... Um... I'm from the UK originally, from England, and then um, uh, we emigrated to Canada, and I was brought up um, on the prairies in Saskatchewan, um, just above North and South Dakota. Um, and so then I went back to drama school in England when I was about 20, and I went to the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art. and studied there and then after i finished study there i went to poland and i studied for a year and then i went to russia and i studied for a year so um, i'm a well-educated actor <laughs> and yeah then the first uh 20 some years of my career were were in the uk and i made a bunch of I, I did a lot of stage work at the royal shakespeare company at the national theater and and I started doing, uh, that's where my film career started there as well. I started with a film called Hanover Street, and then I worked on uh, The Empire Strikes Back, the Star Wars movie, and then, you know, I just played smaller roles. I did um, a movie with um, John Schlesinger called Yanks, and so that was all good, and yeah, I think 
I probably did uh, 60 or 70 movies in the UK and TV shows and stuff. Wow. And then um, I moved back to Saskatchewan. No, first I moved to Toronto. Um, uh, and I stayed in Toronto, and that's where, actually, where we actually filmed Goosebumps. Um, and I stayed there for, I think, 10 or some odd years, 12 years, something like that. And now I'm living in Vancouver. So that's where I am up to, uh, up to date. You got me up to date. Excellent. And uh, yeah, let's talk a little bit about the Goosebumps episode that you filmed. So, uh, of course, you were in uh, one of the first episodes, The Girl Cried Monster, based off the eighth book in the original series. And uh, I guess to start off, how did you uh, get involved with uh, being a part of that episode? Oh, okay. It was it was just lucky for... Um, it was a lady called Anne Tate. She was the casting director on the Goosebumps. And they had brought me in to um, audition for Mr. Mortman. And um, I thought, you know, I did a, a reasonable job, but sadly I didn't get the job. They offered it to another fellow. So I was pretty sad about that, but, you know, there you go, that show business. And, um, then about a week later or something like that, I get it. I got a call that the person that was originally cast as Mr. Mortman fell ill or something like that. And would I, would I come, you know, and do, do the role? So I was like over the moon because I wanted to do the role, you know, because it was all, all like monster and eating crickets and all that, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to do all that stuff. So, um, yeah, I got the job, and um, it was like we were talking earlier. I had to go through this whole wardrobe and makeup procedure. I had to wear a complete prosthetic on my head, and they had to, um, you know, um, it was frightening. It was, you know, really, really claustrophobic. But I managed to get through that, you know, and then once we got all that behind us, then the actual filming of it was a blast. It was lots and lots of fun, yeah. Absolutely. And uh, like I said, Girl Cried Monster is a very well-known, memorable episode, uh, especially for your performance as Mr. Mortman is very, very memorable and uh, very scary uh, to kids. I mean, uh, the, the, eating the crickets and uh, especially the big tarantula. Um, yeah. It's it's creepy when you watch it as a kid. I know because yeah. I was afraid as well because I had to. The crickets were okay because they were all on the desk and stuff like that. And I think I had to eat little gummies. That's what they actually used, or Tic Tac, or something like that for their crickets. But I did have to actually um, wrangle the tarantula, and you know I was. Um, saying that when I was doing it, they sprayed my hand with this, it's called um, uh, a plastic glove. It, and so it's a see, it's see-through and everything like that, but it, it, it actually protects your hands from the tarantula's fur, which is dangerous because apparently if it gets under your skin, it can cause, you know, really like rashes, and it can cause all kinds of um, health mm. problems and stuff like that. So, yeah, I mean, that was a really interesting thing to have, you know, learn to do, you know, to to, to wrangle the tarantula, you know, and to handle these crickets and stuff like that. And, and then when I had the mask on, I didn't want to get the real crickets too close to my face because I didn't want them to jump in my mouth or anything like that, right? <laughs> so all the editing was, was very, very, you know, uh, they had to do some careful editing on that show, you know. I said, oh, don't get the crickets too close to my face. I don't want to eat any crickets, you know, and stuff. <laughs> it was fun. It was fun. And then going going to um uh lucy's mom and dad's house that was really interesting because well you know what happens at the end of that episode right you know mm -hmm. so that was really fun and um the guy who was playing lucy's dad dan 
let i i know i knew him really well from toronto you know so it was when we were in the same episode that was kind of fun and um i i loved it it was such a great one i read a script and i was thinking, oh my god this is such a good twist you know that what happens i don't want to spoil it just in case somebody some of your viewers haven't seen that the episode but yeah so it was a fun it was fun i i have this one of that most fun jobs that I'd had up to that point in my career, right? You know, because, you know, it was, it was, I can't remember if it was put to us as a kid show or a young adult show, but I was thinking that if this is a kid show, it's, it's good. It's, it's, it's a good show. I mean, it's not, like we were discussing yesterday, it's not talking down to kids at all. It's just good entertainment. And and also, it, it is scary. And it's like we were discussing yesterday, too, that, you know, right from the beginning of time, you know, like if you think of, um, you know, um, uh, the three little bears or Little Red Riding Hood. I mean, those are scary stories where scary things happen. And, you know, ancient child's fables, and they never talk down to the children. And I I think that's one of the reasons Goose, Goosebumps is so good, because it never talked down to children either. Absolutely. Uh, Bjorn, you had a question there, just a... Uh... Oh, um, yeah, just earlier on, how we're talking about how it was made for kids and everything. Like, I guess this is the part where I should say, because I, I have mentioned this once before on the podcast... This is the episode that absolutely traumatized my brother oh. uh, to, to the point like we had <laughs> we had a burnt copy of it on uh, VHS because there was no physical release of it. And I remember my mom knew how much I loved it. So when it was on TV, she actually was like, oh, Goosebumps is on. Oh, I'll burn this for my son. You know, he loves it. And then I sat down to watch it with my brother and he was petrified. Uh, it was actually, and it wasn't so much the scenes where you're eating piss and stuff. It was more the part where you're chasing Lucy around the library. I don't know what it was about that, but he was so terrified <laughs> of that, that he hid the video and I could never find it. He would always hide it when I wanted to watch it. So, um, yeah, it was, <laughs> I was like, I want to watch Goosebumps. I want to watch it. I love it. And he's just like, no, we're not watching that ever again. Oh. He, he hated it. Wait, didn't you it. say like, he destroyed he, it eventually he, or something? I thought you remember it. Yeah, he eventually, yeah, he eventually destroyed it. He threw it on the ground and he ripped all the tape out of it. And uh, yeah, I could never watch it again. And it, until they finally, you know, released it on DVD, I could actually watch it again. But I was so sad because that episode was, yeah, never released. It was only, you know, if they would do a rerun on Fox Kids or something. And so I was happy to have it. But, yeah, unfortunately, my brother was so terrified <laughs> of that episode. I, I don't know what it was. I, I think it just everything, the atmosphere they created in that library, like the gloomy yeah. blue filter and the, the music and everything just really freaked him out. And, and I remember using a really weird voice as Mr. Mortman as well. I was going, Lucy, kind of like a, kind of like a bit of a pervert, not a pervert, but <laughs> just like a, a weird guy. Or like, a, you know, I remember speaking really high in my upper register, like, Lucy. Mm -hmm. And I kept laughing under my... Uh, mask because I don't know if you guys are old enough to remember a show called I Love Lucy but uh, Lucy's husband he was uh, I think Cuban Ricky Ricardo and uh, whenever Lucy did something wrong Ricky would always go Lucy you got a lot of explaining to do <laughs> you know, when I was looking for Lucy and I was going, Lucy, Lucy, I kept, kept thinking, well, I'll explain it at all. <laughs> inspiration. Took inspiration from it. Took inspiration yeah. from Ricky Ricardo. Hey, maybe he wasn't That's trying to amazing. eat her. Maybe he was just trying to get her to explain. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> no, oh, I, I just can't wait for my brother to watch this back because he, my brother watches all these episodes and when I finally got to talk to the man that terrified him, <laughs> he's going to love this. How old is your brother now? 
Uh, my brother, so he's he'll be thirty one this year. So he's thirty oh, wow. now. Um, so wow. when when we watched this, we were really young. Like I was probably only five or six. So he would have only been about seven. He was older than me, and he was more terrified of it. But I was just I lived for the franchise. So you know, nothing really scared me with it. So yeah, yeah. But oh. um, yeah, in that episode, you're you're right. It had a really creepy atmosphere. Because, I mean, we've talked about this before, but season one of Goosebumps was different from the others because I feel like they really put their all into how everything looked. And this episode specifically, when you have the library um, at night, it's kind of got like everything's like really dark blue. You got sort of the purple tints coming out of the windows and it just looks very like there's a lot of contrast. And mm -hmm. it just kind of makes the image pop. And then when it's mixed with the brilliant but grotesque design of Mr. Mortman when he's the monster, uh, it makes for a very creepy atmosphere, especially during the chase, uh, because you have Lucy running and running down this endless corridor. Um, and then Mr. Mortman's just kind of like laughing and he's like you're right he's like lucy where are you um and it, it makes for very creepy um i especially remember me personally when i first saw it was right before the commercial break when uh she's like trapped in the corner and he's just kind of like like standing right there mm -hmm. and he's just like dinner served and all that <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's yeah, creepy. he had the comment of uh, he liked fast food. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I love fast food. <laughs> and, and, and it starts, doesn't it, when Lucy's in the library? Because he's first, he's Mr. Mortman, the librarian, and then he changes in to Mr. Mortman, the monster, doesn't he? And and we kind of see that transformation, which which is makes it really scary as well because now he's not dealing with a weird old guy dealing with a deadly monster right mm -hmm. yeah, yeah you I have the know. or like the eyes you can see the eyes actually like bug out of the head mm -hmm. um push the glasses off and yeah yeah i see the head kind of and even Pulsing. like the like like, a a I, 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 like the yeah, the, then, yeah, yeah. Emotion the with the, the tongue, tongue. <laughs> I know, it had like almost like that like the Freddy Krueger tongue almost uh, like uh, very similar to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, it's nice. weird because it, that was a long time ago. I said to Isaiah the, the other day, like how many years ago is that? Twenty years, and you go, well, it's just about thirty actually, just about thirty years that we filmed that. It it just. It's it's so freaky to me that thirty years has gone by that that quickly. Wow. Yeah. So I was yeah. So I'm yeah. That was God. I was only in my thirties when I made that show. It's it's one of the first because one of the first shows I did in Canada because when I came back to Canada from the UK. Yeah, Goosebumps is one of the first jobs I booked in, in Canada. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's great. I mean, we're definitely glad you did because I don't know who had the role before you, but I honestly, like, couldn't imagine this episode with anybody else's Mr. Mortman at this point. Like, exactly. The, the part was played to perfection. I mean, like, when you were the librarian, you, you seemed like a legit librarian, you know, this very, like, normal like very un you know seemly guy just you know has a passion for these books mm -hmm. wanting lucy to be more like uh enthralled with other stuff besides monsters uh yeah. being black beauty you know as a classic but she hated it and stuff like yeah, that yeah. And, yeah but then when you turn to the monster it was a complete flip of the switch you know so well that was, title uh, doesn't lie it is very much and, like a boy who cried wolf story it's because she wants yes. she likes telling monster stories to scare her little brother and she's always just like yeah like when she talks about black beauty it's like it was really boring it could have used like a monster with like big gnarly fangs and all that stuff and he's just yeah. kind of like lucy why don't you go pick out another book like he's just so done with oh, her yeah. <laughs> which is ironic because he's a monster too but he's just kind of like i'm yeah. kind of tired of hearing you talk about monsters yeah. Yeah. 
Mac- and Mac- I was trying to get a blue cardigan on, so I was so, you know, such a uh, a nerd. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I also love because uh, she picks out uh, well he's like go pick out another book and she picks out Frankenstein and he she brings it up to him and he's just like you know Frankenstein's a classic as well <laughs> like I don't want to hear you trash yeah. this book too <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I mean he could be a monster but you know he definitely takes his profession seriously <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah the way he's you know, straightening up the books. I remember even just that one shot I love where, like, it kind of just pans into him, like, straightening up the books. And it's almost like he's so OCD trying to get them perfectly in line. And I just love, like, just those little subtle things in the episode, I think, was so great, like a nice touch, you know? Oh, wow. Yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna have to try... I'm going to have to try and track that... track it down, because I haven't seen it for... I don't know, 30, yeah, well, almost probably 20 years, 25 years since I've seen it. I know some, they were playing them on TV for a while, but I never got to see my episode. Yeah, but I love they, they have them on TV, the but way. they they also I had them on Netflix for a while, but you can find all of them on YouTube, and I'll be sure to, to send a, a link uh, oh. to you via email so you can have that. Okay, that yeah, that'll be great. Yeah, you know what I used to love about Goosebumps? I loved the way the show started with um, music, you know, and that dog, remember? Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> and that was, I really thought that was a great opening for the show. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, who, who, who designed the music? Who did the music and stuff? Did he? Jack Lenz. That was Jack Lenz. Yep. Mm-hmm. He, uh, he did the theme song and he did the music for. Uh, I don't know if he did it for the entire show, but he did like the first season. Um, he so didn't the do music it for the entire doing... show. He did most of it though. Yes, Brad McDonald was the other guy. That, yeah, yeah, we I, found I looked out it up. There was another composer who Brad, did some of the episodes. Brad Mc... Yeah, his name is Brad McDonald. I'm pretty sure that did the other, mm-hmm. the other yeah. episodes, um, like Night Living Dummy Three and those ones. Um, but uh, I, I personally still think that the soundtrack for the Girl of Cry Monster is the most creepiest one, mm-hmm. like soundtrack wise. I think it is very, very eerie. It like agree- just from the opening title credit, even just when she starts talking about, you know, I love to scare my brother, you know, Randy, like even just that music at the beginning, man. Oh, mm-hmm. it's so great. You know, they had great use of like, um, I don't know if it's it's like an organ almost. Uh, yeah. Or like a really mm. bassy piano, and just like, especially during the transformation, they're really leaning heavily on the dun dun dun, like yeah, mm-hmm. and a choir too. I loved when the the show had a choir for the music, uh, yeah. sort of like the ha yeah. yeah. in the background. I don't, I don't find a mask used choir a lot as well. Like that, whenever they did that, yeah, I know Haunted Mask did that, but a Girl Cried Monster had it too, for like mm-hmm. the really really like shocking intense moments. Um, and it worked. It worked a great it deal. It was almost like um, um, a classic horror movie, like um, when they're in a in, in an old abandoned church or something, and you heard the big pipe organs playing, almost like a Frankenstein movie or a, a werewolf movie. One of those, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. They well, gave it a very classic monster vibe with the music, which was great. Uh, mm-hmm. you, something you wouldn't expect from a kids show. I mean, yeah. there were some other kids horror out at the time too, but Goosebumps easily had one of the best scores to episodes it was that were out. Pretty classic, even till today's standards. Season. Like they don't use music quite as well because uh, I watched the new Disney Plus show. They they don't use music in the best way in that episode like they could have uh, compared to a show almost thirty years old now. So yeah. it really just depends who you get. And it's funny because you mentioned uh, who did the music and the dog, especially. We actually had Cal Dodd on an episode recently, and he voiced Slappy. But we also found out he voiced the uh, intro for the Goosebumps show, the viewer beware, you're in for a scare. He did that part, but he says he also did the dog. He so did he did dog. that. <laughs> <laughs> so we, it's funny we found out that that's him, not an actual dog. We were like, that's dog, not a real dog? <laughs> <laughs> uh but um, 
No, I love, and that's the thing, the music in the first season when Jack Lenz was doing it, because we always talk about how the show, as it went on, got a little more goofy, a little more cheesy. Um, yeah. But the first season was just like, in looks and music, was way more slow-paced, atmospheric, creepy, and just really, really worked with the visuals. And that's what music should do. It should complement what you're seeing on the screen. It should go yeah. together. Yeah. But, um... Yeah. I, I, I loved it. It was... I can remember the day... I also can remember the day that we were filming um, the scenes where I get eaten. Oops. <laughs> it's all good. I'm I'm sure most people most of yeah, most of our most of our that. crew has seen the episode. <laughs> yeah, I would I would think everybody who watches this is probably seen it, so I think you're okay. Uh, but I, that I, twist I ending remember, was amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cuz we're sitting at the table and I I remember saying something like, "Oh, this chicken looks very very well done." And then they all looked at each other, mm -hmm. then they all looked at me, and I, and when we filmed it, the director told them, they said, yeah, all of you, jump on you. <laughs> so I was oh. by something, I mean, the next thing I knew, Lucy and Dan and his wife, and all, everyone just jumped on me like they... <laughs> oh, I remember the lines now. It was, um, he says, yeah, so what's for dinner? And they say, well... Since you asked, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, he, and he's like, yeah. he has a great reaction because he's like, he's kind of like, <laughs> he's choking on the meat. He's ball. like, excuse yeah, me, he's like, I thought you said, and then they're like, yeah. and then they yeah. have the like snake teeth, and they're like, that's right, yeah. you are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, it's so such a shame that we don't get really see the parents' monster forms that well because the designs in them, if you see the masks behind the scenes, they were so cool. They're like, like those snake, snake monsters, like those like cobra monsters. You see a bit better in Shocker on Shock Street, but yeah, but um, that's a great line. I just well because y you're in a tense situation because you have you know you have someone who you know is a monster in your house, and you're just waiting at any moment for him to like do something. But then all of a sudden the tables just turn and it's like, you thought you were, <laughs> you were getting the upper hand here. And yeah. it's a great twist ending. It's like, it is a great twist. It's great to me, man. It's like, uh, it reminds yeah. me a lot of, and a lot of Goosebumps endings remind me of that, but it reminds me a lot of the classic EC comics, the Tales from the Crypt and all that. Cause that's very much like an ending out of an EC comic. Yeah. It's just the parents were the monsters all along. Like, yeah, yeah. Wow. <laughs> it's great. And uh, yeah, the deliveries on just like, you are. <laughs> yeah. And you they're are. so nonchalant like, the about it. Like, this, this, this act like this is their average Tuesday. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, the, it, it's funny too because it's not a situation where, because there was another episode where there were parents who were monsters, but the kids didn't know. So they're kind of just like confused, but here it's like, yeah, we're monsters too. We just were kind of like, you know, we can't do anything about it. Yeah. <laughs> we can't. We can't risk well, getting caught. <laughs> the episode you're referring to, I think, is vampire breath. Because yep. Lucy's brother didn't know that his parents were monsters, did he? Mm -hmm. I mean, actually, they did. The, the two kids knew oh, uh, both kids that knew. their parents were monsters because they talk about how. Um, they didn't believe Lucy because they said they haven't seen a monster around this parts for a long time. And then they kind of went over the rules yeah. for monsters. Yeah, they're uh, just like, we can't really But the episode ourselves. Isaiah was talking about was Vampire Breath. And that one had kids who had monsters as parents. But they did, that was a different take because the kids didn't know that the parents were like monsters. So at least they didn't make it out to be. But yeah. I can tell anyways. One. Yeah, another one of the did was my best friend is invisible. That was an, I mean, yeah. they, knew they were monsters, but like <laughs> that yeah. one was like, well, they weren't monsters; they were aliens. And right. um, yeah. it turns out the the ghost, <laughs> the invisible boy, is actually the only human left on Earth, and all the people who were humans are aliens that have faces on the 
the back of their heads. Oh my! <laughs> it's one of the goofiest yet most unsettling effects of the whole show. I don't know. <laughs> it's it's goofy, but it it's if it scared kids, I would not be surprised. Oh yeah, <laughs> that imagery is unsettling. Like, um, I'm trying to think of so, another. Well, what? Which episode did you guys find the very scariest? Ooh. Of uh. Probably Girl of Cry Monster, honestly. Like, that was the one that I think was genuinely creepy. I mean, some episodes had, like, just maybe, like, one scene that would be really scary. Like, like for instance, Attack of the jack o Lanterns has probably one of the most infamous, terrifying, almost, like, I don't know the best way to describe this, Isaiah, but, like, really just uh, disturbing scenes uh where they're up and like they go to this house trick-or-treating and there's like these like old people that have all these kids like ch- chained up but like they have this almost like ogre looking dude like, <laughs> yeah the the, the man is like very like deformed and he's like he traps all these kids because he loves their costumes and they're like i love your costumes <laughs> and they're like you're gonna <laughs> stay here <laughs> forever <laughs> <laughs> he's like he's a- He's like an it, you know, like. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's put like this weird so growth on like, you know, like this cluster oh, of like, zits It also reminds me of like the deformity the shopkeeper has in the Haunted Mask. It's a very similar kind of thing. Yeah, I was thinking that too. But um, yeah. yeah, for me, like for me, the scariest episode, like I didn't watch Goosebumps when I was really little. So like I never really got, I didn't start watching it until I was a bit older. But for me, the most unsettling one, along with Girl Who Cried Monster was the Haunted Mask 2. Just because of the idea of, like, this old man mask that this kid finds. It's kind of like a similar thing to the first Haunted Mask. He puts it on and it fuses to his face. But the difference is this old man mask doesn't make him, like, evil. It slowly, like, starts rapidly aging him and basically slowly kills him. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Like, his hands, like, start, like, morphing into old man hands. And, like, the mask, like, warps and bulges around his face. And it's just, like, really unsettling. The show got weird at times. <laughs> yeah, that's unsettling to, to me. I mean, wow. Can you, yeah. Well, yeah. and That's like classic horror, man, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. the, a lot of Goosebumps stories are derived from classic horror stories, um, yeah. but for kids. So, yeah, yep. and, um, but Girl Cried Monster, I would say that's the scariest episode to me, too, because even mm-hmm. outside of the monster stuff, it does a good job at really making um, sort of even like the scenes where there's no monsters at all seem tense. Because once she knows that Mr. Mormon's a monster and he knows that she knows, he's like showing up at her front door and yeah. being like, can mm. I come in? And she's like, no. Like my parents... I was just going to mention that like Mr. Mormon's chasing her and she just gets into the house or whatever. And I can remember knocking on that door. And then I said, can I come in? And I can remember the look on her face. She was petrified, and she said, no. Because mm-hmm. it's like, now he yeah. knows where I live, and yeah. I'm Strange alone. Strange danger. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Dad, she very Dad stupid. And, like, she, yeah. so, like, she kind of did something really stupid, though. Like, you did a thing you should never do as a kid if you're home alone and someone shows up. Like my parents aren't home right now. <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah. Well, then you then she's like, um, actually, they're uh, someone strangers at your door. Or, <laughs> What's or funny? About opening, yeah, don't ever open the door. Yeah. <laughs> well, she's like, uh, actually, uh, they're in the bathroom. She's like, Mom, yeah, is uh, yeah, yeah. is Dad still polishing his sawed-off shotgun? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's the one I was gonna say. It's, I that's love that line. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> well, but it's oh, I like that. I, I like that scene, and it's really creepy too. Because like he tells her, "I brought your backpack. It's on my way." But then when the parents start talking to her, and he she's explaining that, you know, he came by the house. They're like, "Oh, well, you should be thankful. It's not on his way at all." So. You know, he's already lying to Lucy saying, well, it's on my way, when the parents have already confirmed now, right after that, that it clearly wasn't on his way. So, And, and you know, was, I, uh, wonder, yeah. I wonder if the parents start suspecting that Mr. Mortman is a monster when she, when she tells him that he came to the house. I wonder... You know, so not to frighten her, they say, oh, that was very nice of him to come by with your backpack. 
But really, the the conversation they were having is, oh, there's something very odd about this guy's behavior. Maybe, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. 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 I was going to say, or I didn't think like, about that. That's very possible that that was the moment that the parents realized that maybe there's something to this. Yeah, mm -hmm. because how would they know to invite Mr. Mortman over for a meal and all that kind of mm -hmm. stuff, right? And like, I mean, the, the good thing of it is, is it gets you thinking. I mean, that's when I like, that's when I like good TV or filmmaking is when I leave the cinema and I'm, you know, got my mind going. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's, it's a terrifying episode. And when I see what it did to my brother, like traumatize him, I can only imagine what it would have done to other kids, you know, in the nineties, like this episode, I think really was the scariest one. And even, I think Alan, who we had on the podcast, I think he said it was his favorite one too. Um, mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure he said the girl cry monster was his favorite. So I'm like, I think this, this episode is a personal favorite to a lot of people. Oh, yeah. I think because it is so scary. Yeah. I mean, it, for me, it's in my top 10, if not top five favorite episodes. Like I still haven't like actually thought through like the placement of my top 10, but it's in that mix. It's yeah. easily one of my yeah. favorites. Clearly my hairiest adventure, just saying. <laughs> 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 Real Larry. Yeah. I was saying to Isaiah yesterday that people are still coming up to me and saying, Oh, were you Mr. Mortman in Goosebumps? And like that's thirty years ago, right? Mm -hmm. And and yeah. I go, Yeah, yeah, I was and I cannot believe for a TV show that people are still coming up to me and saying, were you in Goosebumps? And I'm really happy to say, yeah, I was I was in Goosebumps. I was Mr. Borkman. They go, yes, we know. And then they do a funny <laughs> voice or something, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a fantastic episode amazing. in every way. It's a mm. great adaptation of the book. Um, and it's, it's iconic. I mean, when people think of the Goosebumps show, this is one of the episodes that people immediately, their mind snaps to is this one mm -hmm. and maybe like haunted mask and uh, stay out of the basement like definitely one of the more memorable ones uh, for yeah. many great reasons uh, i want to yeah. see the haunted mask when when nick when you send me that link i'm gonna i'm gonna definitely watch this one i'm gonna watch night at the um what's the one where i do rocky in night of the um, living dummy three oh. night of the living yeah. dummy three and I want to watch that because I haven't ever seen that one. And I want to watch Haunted Mask. Is which one do you like, Nick? Haunted Mask one, two, or three? So Haunted Mask one and two are easily in my top five. Haunted Mask one is definitely my favorite episode. Yeah, uh, it felt very um, almost yeah. film quality, like it could have been in a movie theater almost. Like they they did a very well, great job because that was the first episode that aired on TV. So I think oh, they really wow. put a lot of uh, extra effort into that so the show could continue. Yeah, um, yeah. But I know Netflix still has uh, The Haunted Mask. They have Night of the Living Dummy 3. Uh, Welcome to Dead House, which is another great and terrifying episode. Um, and because that kind of, we were talking about that episode actually in a couple uh, episodes ago on the podcast because um, we spoke with Scott Wickware and his wife Marilyn, who were both in that episode. Um, but Scott's been in a few, including The Haunted Mask 2. And that one's on Netflix as well. So there's a few on Netflix, but the link I'll send you has every episode, so you can check out whichever ones you want to. Um, yeah. There's a few There's a few duds out there. Not not every episode was <laughs> as good as The Girl with Pride Monster, but they, uh, they're definitely worth a watch, I think. How many how many did they do in the first season? Was it like 26 or I believe um, it was about uh, I'm uh, was I'm like, thinking it's about my head I should know this. I think they're like I know this if we're head. talking like I think there was 14 like adaptations because there was a few two-parters so if you count the two-parters as individual episodes it was like 17 episodes or something like that or maybe more. But yeah, cuz some of them were legit. It just in terms of like an adaptation of the book it was like 14 episodes i believe yeah, yeah so just about with imdb if you go by that um with the two parters they're they're saying 19 episodes mm -hmm. oh yeah in in season one yep 
in, in season one. And many of those are considered to be among the best. Mm -hmm. um, definitely oh, the best yeah. adaptation. They definitely chose from some of the most popular books um, at yeah. the time. But uh, we earlier mentioned uh, Night of the Living Dummy 3, which you had a voice role in. And uh, we're going to talk about that one in just a second. Uh, but first, uh, if you're, once again, if you're not following the Goosebumps Crew podcast on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts, please make sure you do. You can also find us on rtmedia.org, our uh, networking that we are a part of with other podcasts. All those guys who do podcasts over there really deserve the support. So make sure you go check out rtmedia.org. And before we get back to talking to more Goosebumps, let's have a quick word from our sponsor. This episode is sponsored by Trophy Smack. Everybody wants to feel like a winner, and what better way to feel like one than with a trophy of your accomplishment? As seen on ABC's Shark Tank, Trophy Smack is the ultimate destination for custom fantasy sports awards. Trophy Smack has what you need to celebrate your wins and losses with their large array of customizable championship trophies, belts, rings, and plaques. Their custom-made awards make for the perfect addition to almost any occasion. Anything from fantasy football, corporate awards, gaming, wrestling, esports, and real sports. But even if you're not into sports, Trophy Smack products are customizable for anything. Even for those who want a nice shiny trophy for being the best Goosebumps fan ever. Trophy Smack uses top-of-the-line materials to make superior-made awards that will last for years and years, and made to suit any price point. And if that weren't enough, not only does Trophy Smack have quality made products for affordable prices, but they also include free shipping, free engraving, and 100% guaranteed satisfaction. If you want to snag yourself some quality made awards for your fantasy sports event, visit Trophy Smack's website by clicking the link in the description and check out their large array of trophies, belts, rings, and more, and feel like a champ in no time. And of course, special thanks to Trophy Smack for sponsoring this episode. And now, back to more Goosebumps. So you did a voice role as uh, Rocky, the Slappy's uh, little, uh, I guess I would say henchman in Night of the Living Dummy 3. Um, and uh, Rocky, he's, uh, he's brought to life by Slappy. And uh, we discussed it earlier. He's sort of like, a, like an old school gangster mobster. He's like, sure, sure, whatever you say there, boss. But, uh, but you did the voice for that. So um, did you get called back to do more episodes of Goosebumps? You know what? Okay, I'll be really honest with you. I I don't even remember doing Rocky. Really? Like I, I know I did it because it's on my IMDb era and, I've, and I've seen it. But um, when, you, when I found out that I was going to do your podcast... I really started racking my brains. Rocky, Rocky, how did I? And and then I remember, like I was saying to you, I was doing that movie, Bless the Child. Mm -hmm. And I remember the producer of Goosebumps called me into the recording studio. Um, and and I, that's, that's, and I don't know, is, is, is Rocky a big, is he in the, the whole episode or is he in just one scene or no nope, he is in the whole episode so unlike the book um in the book slappy has a whole bunch of ventriloquist dummies at his side in the episode it's just rocky but he brings yeah. in the life and he and him are just like walking around doing their thing and like i said he's like the henchman so slappy's like sitting over here he's laughing evilly and rocky's kind of like oh, oh, oh he's like shut up who said you could laugh <laughs> I mean, I'm, gonna, I'm dying to see it i'm dying to see this episode so i can hear my voice because once i hear my voice i'm sure i'll re it'll it'll bring me back i do i do remember that i had to go in and revoice it because because the producers thought that my Canadian accent was coming out too often, mm -hmm. and so, so that's why, okay, you, you just because you gotta do, you gotta talk more like, uh, like uh, you know, like go, uh, you know. So and then I, it, it was challenging, and I, I loved it, I think. But yeah, honestly, I cannot, I cannot put an exact. I don't have an exact, sharp, crystal clear memory of, of it. So when I get to see it, it'll be like a first time viewing for me. 
Well, yeah. that's really it's, interesting. It's one of the most iconic episodes too. Like Night of Living Dummy really? Three is is in most people's like top five. So like, do I have, seen, do like, I have a, a credit? Does it say Voice of Rocky by Eugene Lipinski? Yes, you do. Yeah, yeah, it's in the credits too, and it's that's what I mean. Like it, this is a personal favorite to a lot of people as well. This episode, so like uh, it's and it, it, but, it features uh, someone else from Star Wars too, actually. Uh, a very famous actor from Star Wars, Hayden Christensen, who played Anakin Skywalker in episodes two and three. He's actually in it when he's very young. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna. You guys got to give me your um, your details because once I watch it and I hear it, I'll I'll write to you and I'll say, "Oh my God, I listened to the episode and." <laughs> You know, thank you so much for making me aware of it. But I, enough to, you know, go back and and watch it. You know. Yeah, and uh, I mean, he is a a really funny character. When you listen to it, it's just so funny because again, he do he he's like the old school like like I'll do whatever you say, there, boss. But um, at the end, uh, they try to because Rocky in this family that owns all these dummies. Rocky's been like a personal favorite of the family and Slappy's kind of taken him for himself but then they're kind of like well Rocky like listen like you are part of our family don't listen to him and then uh just when you think he's gonna like continue doing what Slappy says he just turns around and he knocks Slappy in the face <laughs> And he just starts <laughs> tossing him around. He's like, what are you doing? He's like, never go against the family. <laughs> he was the Vin Diesel. He was the Vin Diesel of uh, dummies at the time. Yeah, man. It's all about family. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, you're talking about the Fast and the Furious. <laughs> yeah. He's yeah. like, family. <laughs> family, yeah. Uh, I watch all those stupid movies, the Fast and the Furious movies. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how they can make the same movie ten times. <laughs> I don't know how they can do it, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, but, um, I, I, but, yeah, it's it's so funny because, like, mo you know, as an actor, even, like, the smaller roles I've played, I, you know, you, you remember the people that you work with, you remember everything, but, and, and, and I, I don't remember the process of being cast as Rocky, like, I don't know if I had to go in for another, you know, audition for that, I don't know how it happened, all I do is ha I have this vague memory of being at the recording studio, and being there with the producer and us going over some of the the text and stuff, but um, yeah, I wonder. I I don't know why I I, I can't remember that, but uh, maybe something bad was happening in my life at that time. I don't know. Mm. Well, it's interesting you never know. <laughs> because, like, well, like I said, we had Cal Dodd on who voiced Slappy, and he said the same thing actually. Even though like he voiced Slappy in uh, four episodes when you count the two part. Uh, he had said that you know he didn't really remember a lot of his time with Slappy either, oh, and God. I don't know if that's because like he wasn't on set. You were just kind of like in yeah. an ADR room, kind of a deal. Yeah. Read some lines and you left, um, yeah. or or what the case is. But he said the same thing. So, oh good, okay. So I don't, yeah, because I maybe I was getting you know like a senior's moment or something, <laughs> but. Yeah, no, I can't. Oh, so then he didn't die. Well, yeah, I think you make a good point like that. Yeah, probably because you weren't physically on set. You didn't meet the rest of the actors. You didn't have lunch with them, you know. You didn't spend hours and hours and hours learning lines, you know. And, yeah. Um, so, but, yeah. yeah. I feel that has a lot to do with it, uh, just based on what he said and what you're saying now, so... I think that's a totally different experience because, like you said, if you're not on set to yeah. make these memories, yeah, uh, like you can remember so many things about the girl who cried monster and how yeah. great of a time that was, and and when it comes to just voice acting, like just for you know an episode, or in this case a two-parter, uh, yeah. it was just kind of something that was on the fly. It seems like so you, they got your lines done and you know and just had you go on your way. You didn't meet anybody. They probably didn't yeah. even send you a. 
the episode when it was done. It's so. very, it's very impersonal because I do, I do some um, cartoons. You know, I do voices for some cartoons, and it is so impersonal. You go there, you don't even hear anybody give you a throw-in line. They just give you a list of lines to say. Line one, line two, line three, you know, line one, mm -hmm. hello, how are you today? Line two, yeah, very good. Line three, go, you know, whatever. Okay. Sorry, it smell, smells like someone smoking in my house, but. <laughs> <laughs> it's a ghost. Okay. It's Rocky. It's Rocky. <laughs> oh, Rocky. Sorry, boss. Rocky. Oh, sorry, boss. <laughs> hey, boss. How come you don't remember me? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's so great. Let's take revenge. Yeah. Oh no, man, that's once crazy. I, once I watch the episode, and then you guys, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll come back on, um, I'll come back on your podcast, and then I'll, I'll be able to do all the, uh, all the lines for work, no problem. <laughs> That'd yes. be awesome. <laughs> oh, um, I, that'd be amazing. But um, but yeah, I mean, it, it was awesome to find out that you were in um, another episode, uh, even if it was you know a voice role and not, you know, like Girl Cried Monster being there on the physical set. Um, but I'm curious. Uh, so in terms of the Goosebumps as a whole, um, we've talked to many actors in the past who were, especially who were in the early days of the show. And we always like to figure out, were you aware or did you know about Goosebumps before you did the show? No. Ah. no because I was in my 30s, you know, so if I hadn't read those books when I was in my, you know, um, pre-teen or early teen years, I mean, who, what, when... I never asked R. L. Stein this, but I mean, who did he mean the books to be for? What age group did he ever? Does he ever say? I think he intended it for probably, I'd say, maybe four to fourth to sixth graders, sort of not like early school, but probably like preteen before middle school, I'd say. So nine, ten year olds to 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 early. I'd yeah, like I'd say, yeah, I'd, say, I'd, say I'd say elementary is the middle school because he also did another series that was geared towards teenagers and adults, and that was Fear Street. So oh. he already had a, a book series for the older audience, and so this one was more geared towards those elementary to middle school kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I remember there was a um, an old. Uh, old news report on goosebumps like an old 90s one and i remember one of the reporters that was uh, interviewing rl stein uh, they did mention it eight to 12 year olds so i think that so that was kind of the age and that was that seems about right i mean i i was reading them earlier uh like a lot earlier i was only like five but i think the target was eight to 12 was from what i remember from that old report and Arl Stein was there when they were talking about it. It was a really old one from the nineties. Like, I think it was like 1995 or 96 or something. Um, I'll have to try and find it again, but yeah, they specifically said eight to 12 year olds. So just before high school sort of age. Yeah. And, uh, speaking of Arl Stein, uh, we were talking about it a little bit before the show. Um, but you had said that you actually got a copy of the Girl Cried Monster signed by R.L. Stein himself. Yeah, because he came to Toronto and um, he had lunch with us and um, he gave me one of the books and he signed um, uh, to Eugene, my favorite librarian. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you have the TV book, the, the TV Presents version book? Because there's actually color photos of you inside it. I think Isaiah's got one on hand. Yep, yep. I do too. So this book. No, came I, out... I don't. No, I don't have that one. So this book came out uh, around the same time as the episode, um, and it's sort of like a. It's almost like how movie novels are done, where somebody oh, yeah. writes a book that's based on a movie. It's sort of like the movie in a book, and that's what this is. Um, but they also do have color photos inside of uh, the episode. So, like, right there is the scene where you're at the door talking oh to Lucy. Oh, my gosh, yeah. 
Wow, look how fat I was. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we got oh, another one right here. Yeah, of how you in makeup. Crickets. Oh my gosh, look at that. Oh, it's really cool. It's awesome. Mm-hmm. Some of these... you copy. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, I have an extra. I'll have to send one to you. Yeah, you you got to have one of these. I'll pay, I'll, I'll pay you for it. <laughs> oh, no, but no, it's, no, no. Uh, it's a it. great it's book. It's a great uh, collectible. We'll be happy mm-hmm. to send you one. I'll send it. Oh, that's so nice. Yeah. No, mm-hmm. I mean. I am. I listen. I gotta tell you guys how I didn't realize this whole world of people who are fans of Goosebumps even existed. When I when I saw the new series on TV, and I I started watching one episode, and I thought, oh no, this is not old Goosebumps. This is this is. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. Good. So. I, I, I didn't watch the whole episode, but I didn't think it was. I didn't think it had the same pizzazz as, as the old. Didn't. I didn't even realize that it was the same show. I didn't realize it was the same Goosebumps as the original Goosebumps. I, I, I know that sometimes, like I've been in movies, like I was in a movie called Moonlighting, and. There are other movies and TV shows called Moonlighting that have nothing to do with the Moonlighting Island. So that's what I thought that Goosebumps that I saw on TV was. But apparently that's R.L. Stein's work as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. It's very loosely based. And I, I, a lot of us feel like it's Goosebumps by name only. Ah. Uh, because they took too many liberties with his work. And yeah. trying to make this show, so uh, it didn't stick with a lot of like original Goosebumps fans. Yeah, you know yeah. the the actual content of Stein's work. Um, yeah, some people liked it just because it was different. But if you're going to use Goosebumps, don't make it different or make it something new mm-hmm. by itself. Then at that point, yeah, uh, I... as a way a lot of us were looking at it. So yeah, no, we're with you. It, it definitely doesn't <laughs> have that same uh, feel and. I want to say lightning in a bottle moment that the '90s show had. Yeah, you know it's, it's it's so weird. I mean, it's so rare that things that are created off of things that were really good in its time. You know, when they try to recreate them, they're very rarely as as good. Mm-hmm. You no. Know? Like when you watch TV shows that are remakes of a show that, you know, in days gone by. And I always watch just to see if they have the same sort of, you know, interest cachet to me. But normally I end up turning them. Hey, you didn't make your bed there, I can see. <laughs> yeah, I have a busy day today, so. <laughs> you better. But, um, yeah, no, nothing will compare to the original 90s show. Like, I've, I've been collecting Goosebumps for 24 years now. I just realized this year is 24 years I've been collecting it. And I, I probably spent, like, three, four hundred grand. I, I couldn't tell you how much I've spent <laughs> on Goosebumps stuff. It's ridiculous. Yeah, like, I, 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 you have the biggest Goosebumps collection in the world. I do. I, I, I think I do. Well, there was another guy sure um, actually that had a pretty big collection, but he's recently started selling all this stuff. So I, I would say I probably do definitely yeah. now. Uh, you like, your name in the Guinness Book of Records. <laughs> yes, I will. Well, I'll get I'll get someone to send you a, a photo. I'll, I'll, if you send your details through, I'll send you some better, clear pictures because it's a little – it's a little blurry if I try to show it on here, but I'll, I'll yeah. send some proper good photos so you can get an actual good look at yeah, you know, how it cool. looks. But it's yeah. a testament. Right. If you see that collection, it's just a testament to how big that franchise was. And it may not reach those heights as it was in the 90s, but it will be remembered um, for years and years to come because, you know, kids who grew up with it in the 90s are now adults and they can pass it on to their kids who will probably pass it on to their kids it's one of those things that will live forever um definitely and and yes you know there's that's what i was saying to my friend the other day you know if nothing else i will be remembered for goosebumps 
Absolutely. Oh, yes. 100%. You, I think you've done so thing many do. things, though, in your career, and it's impressive. Like, when the moment you said you were going to come on, I was like, oh, I got to look and see what else you've done because I, I know I've seen you in other things and it made me go through and look, but like things I didn't even know you were in maybe because I was so young watching it, like Superman 2. Um, you know, I know you were in Arrow because that was one of my uh, favorite shows when it was yeah. on. Uh, so I remembered you from that and, you know, a few other things, but like it, it's impressive to see how many things you've actually done. So I feel like you'll be remembered for more than Goosebumps. Uh, yeah. But for this crew, Goosebumps is definitely the number one thing we'll remember you for. Or remember you, Mr. Oh. Mortman. Yeah. <laughs> yes, always Mr. Mortman. But it's funny we had <laughs> we had um, Kai Eric Erickson on here who played Billy in Welcome to Camp Nightmare, and he even said specifically his thirty year career, and he gets more fan mail, more love for his role in Goosebumps than anything else. You wow. know, and I'm just like, wow, well, there you go. You know. <laughs> But yeah, and I still, I know what I'm saying is I still can walk down the street almost every day. Someone will say, "Were you in Goosebumps?" I remember <laughs> once about oh, this is maybe about ten before I moved to Vancouver. Anyway, I this little kid came up to me. I was in the supermarket and I had my shopping, and he goes, "Hey," he goes, "Are you uh, are you Mr. Mortman?" And I go, "Yeah." He goes. Let me see what you eat. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, yeah, I'm lucky, I'm lucky I had good food in there, right? Like, I had salad and broccoli and stuff. He goes, oh, look what you eat. It's disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> There's no crickets at all. Oh. <laughs> Have you actually ever tried? like tried tarantula legs and stuff like because you know you can you can actually get that stuff to eat like have you ever been like curious what a tarantula might actually taste like because maybe I've where tried you are in australia legs. where you guys have that stuff but yeah where you the I mean, I've seen, there like, get monoliths <laughs> i mean i've seen like little boxes of like edible crickets and stuff that yeah, are like cheese yeah. flavored and stuff like i've seen those and i've actually tried those before yeah <laughs> you know, it's like oh. places like jungle like, gyms and stuff cheap. though yeah mm-hmm. Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> yeah, they're good. I, mean, I mean, I used to, I, I used to have a pet bearded dragon, and we fed him was, um, we fed him crickets all the time. Oh, hmm. and he did well. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but no, I mean, this episode is iconic, and the show is iconic because of episodes like this and uh, the performances uh, from actors like yourself. And for that, we Goosebumps fans are very grateful. Very grateful. Well, thank you. And now I'm a fan of you. I'm a fan of the Goosebumps fans. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Ooh, that's awesome. <laughs> well, uh, that is going to do it for uh, tonight's episode of the Goosebumps Crew Podcast. And Eugene, thank you again so very, very much for joining us and talking about Goosebumps. Thank you so much. And really lovely to meet you guys. Honestly, uh, it's a real thank treat. You so Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, we hope to talk soon. And, uh, So, uh, yeah, that's going to do it for tonight's episode. As always, make sure you follow the rest of my Goosebumps crew, Goosebumps Aussie fan Bjorn Panlik, Shaw and Nick Shaw, and the Ultimate Goosebumps man Michael Lilliquist on their social medias and YouTubes because they really, really, really do deserve it. And, of course, give us a sub at the Goosebumps channel on YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram. And also be sure to follow the brand new Goosebumps crew YouTube channel. New episodes Wednesdays will always be posted there and on Spotify and Apple Podcasts where you guys can catch those. And uh, that's going to do it for tonight. So for all of us here at the Goosebumps Crew Podcast, we want to wish you all to take care, stay safe, and have a very scary day.